to another edition of Cafe on Tampa Online. Uh, today, we're um, excited to have Michael Tomor, who's the executive director of the Tampa Museum of Art. Michael, uh, welcome, and tell us about yourself, and also tell us about the museum for anybody who hasn't been there before. Sure, sure. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, um, the I've been with the Tampa Museum of Art since April of 2015, so I just um, hit a hallmark five years um, here in Tampa. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, this is my 21st year of directing art museums in the United States, my third museum, and um, I'll be here for quite a while. I love it here. Um, the Tampa Museum of Art is just this year celebrating its 100th anniversary. Um, we had um, four different iterations of ourselves over the years since 1920, and we were excited to launch um, 2020 with a grand celebration of um, contributing to the landscape of arts and culture in our community um, over the last 100 years. So um, to tell that story and actually learn about it simultaneously um, has been a really wonderful experience and um, really the resolve of the community to have arts and culture here for this long um, really demonstrates the need and the interest and the responsiveness of this what was the museum? At, tell us about the museum in the beginning. Do you know anything about who yeah. started it? What it was? It started with a gift from the person, or how, how did it? Start? Oh God, wouldn't that be great? No, um, in uh, most museums um, in small communities like Tampa was in 1920, they got their starts um, showing artwork in municipal galleries or in libraries, and that was very normal. And in the city of Tampa, they started um, showing artwork at um, City Hall um, in um, the Red Cross Room in 1920. Um, it became an independent organization that fundamentally showed artwork and by 1924 had merged with the, the um, student art um, um, society and to recreate itself as the Tampa Art Institute. And that organization since 1926 had existed all the way through the, 19, um, through the 1950s and 1960s. So fundamentally, they showed art, but then when they merged with the Student Art um, Society, they um, started teaching art as well. And that became the hallmark and probably the traditional way in which art museums got their start, showing art and teaching how to create art. We then, in the 1960s, um, by virtue of some financial challenges, we were located on Boulevard in the old state fairgrounds right next to where University of Tampa is. Oh. And we merged with the University of Tampa for a very short time and changed our name to the Tampa Bay Arts Center. And we were under the umbrella of the University of Tampa for about four years. And in 1969, went independent again, until the city of Tampa approached us in the mid 1970s and said, look, we would really like to make a major commitment of arts and culture in the community, and we want you to join our team. So in 1978, um, the Tampa Bay Arts Center um, started its movement to become the Tampa Museum after merging with the predecessor to MOSI um, and the Children's Museum, and it was called um, the, um, the Junior Museum. So those two museums joined, and we became the Tampa Museum. And within um, four years, um, by 1983, 1984, we were the Tampa Museum of Art, a division of the Department of Recreation with the city of Tampa. And then from that point forward, um, we became a collecting art institution. Um, we started to build um, collections, um, fundamentally um, art of our time, which would now be considered contemporary art, modern art, which goes back through the 19th century, and um, also antiquities. And that became fundamentally the direction of this institution to collect um, ancient art and also to um, collect and explore modern and contemporary art. And that's where our collections were built from and that's the type of programming we do. So we have close to 8,000 works of art in our collection. And um, we tell stories of um, ancient and art of our time. And we have been doing that for now for, um, well, um, certainly since the collecting of my, and becoming the Tampa Museum of Art, um, but we have had that lineage all throughout our history. So, so even though the organization is 100 years old, uh, you've only really been collecting, what did you say, 30 years? Well, um, with a formal plan, right? So as the Tampa Art Institute was developing, there are actually pieces in our collection that were brought over in the mergers and in the transference. So the Tampa Art Institute had a very small collection. 
um, really around or less than 100 works. And then the Tampa Bay um, Art Center also collected and all of those assets were transferred um, to the new title of the institution, Tampa Museum, when it, it became um, part of the city, except that the city never retained those assets they fell to the nonprofit volunteer organization, Tampa um, Federation, which then became Tampa Museum of Art, and they became the holder of the assets. So sometimes when people are traveling the world, they go to you know some of the best museums in the world, and they wonder how come we don't have Van Goghs and uh, Monets and and other paintings like that. Yeah. But even though we're 100 years old, we've really only been majorly collecting 20, 30 years, it sounds like. And could you tell us, uh, yeah. you know, the, the parts of the collection are really well known and respected worldwide. Could you tell us, uh, you know, what those are and, and why? Sure. Um, well, let me just go back to your point about, you know, the notion of where's our Van Gogh and where's our Matisse. I will tell you that um, communities like Tampa that were small and built up over the years, um, they, they, the collectors of our community um, are relatively new to the community. So they may have only arrived here in the 60s or 70s as our museum was burgeoning. But think about some of the community museums that grew into large metropolitan um, museums, um, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the Carnegie in Pittsburgh, where the um, industrialists and, and the wealthy um, community members were heavy collectors of art. Um, and um, also art was transferred to them generation over generation and then they help build those collections. Um, so um, when you think about someone like um, um, Mellon, for example, or Samuel Kress, Samuel Kress um, helped build the Metropolitan Museum of Art Collection of European Art. He was a collector in the 1910s and 20s. And when the wing opened at the National Gallery, um, he gave um, 1800 original works of European art. So that's how that sort of happens. And that really never happened for the Tampa Museum of Art, really fundamentally because the community wasn't heavily into collecting. And it doesn't mean today there aren't great collections here. And we borrow from our regional collections all the time. But at that time, it wasn't part of the kind of the DNA of, of, of the community. Um, at any rate, that's changing now. And we're really fortunate to have some great collectors and lenders. So of our collection, probably the most um, frequently lent works of art of our, out of our collection is our collection of ancient Greek and Roman art, um, considered by most scholars and academics to be one of the finest collections in the southeastern part of the United States. For our community, it's one of the largest collections of ancient Greek and Roman art um, in all of the southeastern part of the United States. And people um, love the fact that we can offer that type of um, understanding of creativity and Western civilization and world culture right here. But we're also seeing now that we've published our book and we're seeing ourselves more online, um, that we're lending a lot of our works from the permanent collection of modern and contemporary as well. So we're, our works are getting out there, but we are maybe looking a little bit young in the eyes of what's available um, out there, but we're thrilled to be part of um, the, you know, the landscape of lending in North America, um, but also internationally of our um, ancient collections. And the, the idea of the contemporary collection, it, correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, besides getting wealthy donors to give you their collection, which hopefully some people watching will do that, yeah. uh, but besides that, what you want to, what I think you want to do is collect the next a, a Monet or Picasso or Dali or whatever, right? You're, so you're collecting contemporary art with the hopes that some of it will become, um, you know, it, it, you're the expert, tell me. <laughs> yeah, well, all right. So um, we aren't collecting like um, some individual might collect. People should collect because they want to collect something they love to look at. Museums collect because we're looking at artwork as a reflection of the, of the culture out of which it was created and the, and the artists that created that work. So we're not necessarily looking at great um, monetary value to artwork. We're looking at cultural reflection. We're looking at great talent and quality. And we hope that as time moves on, um, that the work of art that we have selected to tell that story about that person at that time in that place, um, the artist world, um, resonates with the community in a way that's meaningful. So regardless of whether the artist becomes the most important artist in the world, um, becomes the most significant artist of your community, whatever that is, we want to make sure that the artwork that we collect here tells great stories. And um, if anybody watching wants to ask a question, don't forget that if you're watching on your phone, 
uh, ask a question underneath the feed. And if you're watching on your computer, uh, ask to the right. Uh, so if you put your questions, we'll try to get to them. Um, there's a lot that we can talk about. We have a short amount of time. I forgot to ask about the building that you're in right now. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm so um, this building that we're in right now um, opened in 2010. Um, it was the long-term dream of um, the mayor of our city, um, Dick Greco, to create a cultural um, keystone um, for a redevelopment of downtown. And this facility became the result of that, um, that energy and, um, and meaning of having arts and culture be connected along the Riverwalk. And um, so we've enjoyed being in this um, building for, for um, 10 years now. And we are still growing and maximizing our programmatic resources for the community. Um, it was designed by Stanley Sadowitz, an artist um, architect out of, Cal out of um, um, California, Northern California. And um, it's a spectacular example of contemporary architecture and the facade um, is a work of art done by an artist from the Southwest named Leo Villarreal with a digital light show that you can really only see at night that has an infinity, an infinitum number of iterations. So if you're downtown at Curtis Six and Parker along the Riverwalk, make sure that you're looking north at the facade of the museum because you're gonna see a great work of art in production all the time. Yeah, and thank you to um, uh, the supporters of the museum. Uh, that museum's not very old and a lot of people who may be watching uh, contributed to that. So, you know, we need people to support the arts in our community in lots of different ways. Yeah. Uh, so one of the big things that you brought to the museum is all these exhibitions. I mean, a couple of years ago, you had like four or five major exhibitions going on at the same time and the place was packed constantly. Um, can you tell us now pre COVID-19, can you tell us what your, what your strategy was? And, uh, and then we'll talk about what's happening now. Sure. You know, we want to make sure that we're telling, you know, relevant stories to the community. We were fortunate all just in, in 2018, um, we had this, kind of remarkable year of exhibitions that we connected together thematically on the emotion of love. And um, that was um, the, um, the borrowing of the um, Vinick Family Foundation um, collection of the Kusama installation room, the Yayoi Kusama's Love is Calling, with this great sculpture exhibition of Robert Indiana's work, a fabulous um, um, contemporary um, reflection on antiquity by Patty Cronin. And those three exhibitions really launched a major season and on the heels of that, another really fabulous exhibition of um, abstract expressionism, a major movement post-World War II in the United States. And we had a great fall lineup season in 2019, um, which dealt with the Afro-Caribbean diaspora, the African-American experience, and assemblage and found objects being used by self-taught artists. So what we're trying to make sure of is that the stories that we're telling through the exhibitions that we hold have relevance to members of our community and not only the same members, but different members, people from different walks of life, different ethnicities, different races, um, different um, backgrounds. We want everybody to see themselves in our museum. And so the variety of exhibitions, hopefully will touch on something that someone can reminisce on about themselves and see relevance that they too are part of a cultural heritage and artistic heritage in our world. Um, so um, that has been building and our attendance keeps growing. So um, in 2015, we clocked in about 46,000 visitors and last year we were close to 90,000. So our attendance is leveling out somewhere between um, 80 and 90,000 visitors right now. Of course, we're closed at the moment um, due to the, the community shutdown, but um, we believe that that will continue to grow. And that's the general attendance. And those are people that are taking advantage of our programs, which are not just on site anymore, because as the result of having a wonderful partnership with the Hillsborough County Commissioner's interest in having art be provided to residents of their community throughout the county, we are teaching offsite at six different locations. So we're not just teaching downtown, but through the Firehouse Cultural Center, um, through the Winthrop Arts Factory in Riverview. So in Ruskin and Riverview, um, we're teaching at the County Recreation Centers in West Chase, Keystone, and Sonona Sassa. And we just started a relationship with the, um, the RCMA and Waimama um, to teach. And we're expanding our teaching opportunities and programs offsite now. So I'm excited to say that our reach is there and we're really meeting our mission to make sure that 
people have art available to them so that they can be personally expressive and tell their own stories, but hear the stories of other artists through their artwork. And so it's a real communication uh, yeah. opportunity. The great thing you mentioned, like I, my kids uh, through school and also uh, with me went to see the Kusama exhibit, or Robert Indiana exhibit, but then they walk around, they get to, they get to discover the Greek and Roman exhibit and, and yeah. you had the Venus to Milo and other. Um, tell us also, you have uh, an outdoor um, public art uh, uh, part of it too, because you, you believe in the um, kind of democratization of art, right? You are the Absolutely. accessibility of art. And boy, would I like to do that more often. So when we have an opportunity to put works of art outside, we, we want to do that. And we have many times in the past. But we decided to make a monumental purchase when we purchased Laura with Bun, this 26 foot tall um, portent steel sculpture of a woman that sits on the north side of our museum on the Cass Street side near the Poe parking garage. And it tells the story of this um, stunning um, artist and his portraiture work that is available to be viewed at all times. I love public art. I think it's very important. It allows people to view at their own leisure, um, at their own time schedule, and have a wonderful interactive experience, um, you know, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, you know, and I'd want to be able to do that more often. And we are looking seriously at what that means um, to, to be part of that outdoor landscape as well as what we can show inside. So you kind of alluded to this earlier, but you have put a lot of your content and collection online now, and there are lots of activities that people can do online. Can you tell us you know, what your website is and how people can access that content and interact with the museum online? Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you're not following us on Facebook, you need to do that. So that will tell you everything that's happening at the museum, both virtually now and on site. Um, and, and what we have is a um, an every day we have a posting for an activity, a 30 minute recess activity that you can do at home. So you can find that at a new museum um, at our homepage that's called Museum From Home. And you just log on to that and that material's um, available for you to, to work on, your kids to work on, or you to work as a family on. Just a 30 minute art um, program that you can do at home with instruction. And then every Saturday, in lieu of the fact that we haven't been open and art spot which is a free community drop-in program to create art every saturday morning multi-generational you bring your kids you bring your parents and you can create together here at the museum in lieu of that our studio art program coordinator anthony record has been doing a weekly um, online class um, that you can follow along with it takes about 40 minutes um, but every week we post a new one and you can find those online and we're going to start doing um, virtual um, curatorial discussions and tours so that starts next week. Um, but all of that can be found at our website at um, tampamuseum.org, museum from home. And, um, and that, that's really exciting. So we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, um, we're on Twitter, um, and you can find out everything that you need to know about what's happening at the museum, um, both offsite and onsite. Thank you. And, um... Uh, I've said this a couple of times in other interviews, but it's worth saying again, uh, during this time that we've all been safer at home and especially safer at home with our kids, yeah. uh, we've been using the arts. Um, we, you know, we've either been watching movies or, or watching Netflix, uh, playing video games, uh, just about everything that, that we've been doing other than work has been arts related. And so, uh, you know, thank God for the arts because we all would have been super, super bored over the past couple of months. So hopefully coming out of this, people will be even more appreciative of and supportive of the arts. Yeah, I think they're really hungry for that bill. And, and I know that people are really missing it. And the one thing that I will tell you is that art is the great equalizer for communicating. And if you're not taking advantage of being creative and you don't think that you could be creative because you haven't really tried it, um, or if you actually don't think that you're an artist and everybody is in their own way, I really encourage you to find a spot for yourself and, and learn how to be creative. And we can help you do that here at the museum. You can either learn it through other artists work or you can do it yourself. And that's a very important part of being a human being, I think, and, and something necessary for a whole life. And one of the things also is you all have been very supportive of the grassroots arts movement and you yeah. had uh, one or two forums over the last couple of few months to yeah. talk to emerging artists about the business of the arts. Can you tell us about that too, please? 
Yeah, you know, you know, I'm a firm believer, and, and you know this, Bill, and many members of the community do, that I believe that what we do in our community needs to be looked at as a serious component, not just a quality of life, but as a business. So an individual artist in and of themselves is a business contributor, and so are art museums and art galleries. We're not a fringe organization um, that feeds another type of a business model. We are a business in the community, and we, we're contributing, and we're trying to help the communities thrive. Um, as well as those people who are a part of it. And to that end, we need to listen to the artists and what they need and how they're going about their business model, how we can help them, and really in turn, how can they help us become a much more solid part of the community landscape. And I say this, that if there's a business out there that doesn't have an artist at the table, the decision-making table, then you're missing a creative aspect of um, problem solving and um, evaluative skills. Is artists do have a special way about interpreting and re-evaluating things around them. And sometimes they um, hit the spot a lot faster um, than those that aren't practicing that on a regular basis. So we convened artists together here at the museum and we asked them what their needs and interests are. Um, we were excited to know that most of them were interested in how to better balance live, work and, and um, play experiences. Part of the reason is, is that most full-time artists are also full-time employed in something that may or may not be part of the art world. So they're creating for themselves and for others, but then they're also making a living in more of a standard fashion um, for their families. And th that balance is really important. So we learn that from our artists and we're gonna start as soon as we get back together again, um, start talking about that and bringing guest speakers on how they can better um, manage that full-time job over a full-time career. And um, I'm excited to have that, but we learned a lot more from them. And um, we're really just looking forward to getting back in touch with them again in person. And we believe that that's around the corner. And in the meantime, we will start doing some virtual programs with them as well. Great, thank you for doing that. And um, it, don't forget anybody who happens to be watching, please, uh, if you have a question, post it either underneath or to the right of the video feed. And we have one, it's not a question, it's more of a comment. It says, uh, thank you for focusing on art that reflects people who don't look like me. Uh, my world can be so homogeneous. I heavily rely upon art to try and see the world from a different perspective. That's great. I couldn't agree with that more. You know, and, and that's the, you know, when we, we think about artists are telling stories from their own vantage point, but they're also telling stories um, about the people around them and, and the things that are happening. So they are, um, they're telling stories about why they do what they do, when they do it and how they do it. But they're also telling a lot about their time and place and history and in space and location. And you can learn a lot from them just by looking at their artwork. So tell us what your plans are. I know they're going to be up in the air because of all the orders that are out there. Uh, but you've probably been listening to all the other museums around the world and what people are kind of thinking. Yeah. Um, so what what do you think is your plan for the rest of the year? Well, you know, it, it's, it's a very good question. So we have been modeling to open um, back up to the public um, based on the CDC um, recommendations and also our public officials recommendations on convening. Um, we hope to be reopened um, the first week of June. Um, we're limiting the capacity in all of our um, spaces, um, our gallery spaces, to 25% of its maximum occupancy. But we are planning to maintain our regular hours of operation when we do reopen. And I do say planning because we know what's happening right now, which is um, from one 24-hour period to the next 48, things can change very quickly in our community right now. But that's our goal. Um, my team should all be back to work um, in the next um, 15 to um, 30 days. And we're looking forward to welcoming all of you. We are going to be following the CDC recommendations when it comes to how we behave and how we expect those that visit us um, behave, which is trying to keep social distancing at a priority. Um, some people will feel very comfortable and we're um, wearing um, facial um, protective gear. And we will be following all of those. And that, that guideline of policies on reopening will all be published on our website. Um, we'll let people know what we're doing and we want them to feel comfortable about coming back in. Um, and we're ready for to start seeing some people in our community. I mean, it's too long, right? And I think a lot of people are ready to go yeah. 
to a museum too. Um, tell us about the the future. I think you had some future plans before yeah. this hit, but um, what what are your plans uh, after hopefully this passes? So maybe twenty twenty one beyond. Yeah. Well, listen, I don't believe that for one minute that the growth that we had been experiencing over the past five years is going to stop. I think that it was a mandatory stop um, to help stop the spread of COVID-19. But the stop of growth at our at our museum is not really possible. So the expansion of our programs is still very important and most on, my, on our minds. Our community wants to see more art on view. We're looking at the opportunities that we have to exhibit more art look at additional spaces to show more art, expand our education footprint here at the museum. We are looking to address growth um, at the museum while all of Tampa is experiencing growth. And that is not going to stop um, because there was a minor shutdown in 2020. Th it's gonna grow exponentially and we will all be back on target before we know it. And we still have to address the, 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 the enormous amount of um, growth in, in the arts, in our community, in the economy, and we want to get ahead of that eight ball. So the future is addressing the situation of growth, um, and it has to be done in a way that's responsible. And I have to tell you, I've got the most remarkable board of trustees and board of directors, um, a wealth of information and talent and, and from the business community and the philanthropic community. And with them, um, we've got a team that can't be reckoned with and we're moving forward on growth. And we've been talking about it now for the last two to three years. It's part of our strategic initiatives from five years ago, four years ago, and it's not going to stop. So we're looking at offering more to a community that is asking for more. And we're, we wanna make that happen as soon as possible. And we're still strategizing to make that happen. So unless somebody has another question, I'll ask my final question, which is that, um, geek out on arts for a second. You're one of the big thinkers in our area on the arts and you really think about its economic impact, how it's connected to the community. Could you just talk about that for a couple of minutes? You know, why, what is the, the, the relative importance of a museum and then, and then maybe talk about the arts in general in the community? Sure, I, I think that, again, I'll go back to the fact that we're an in integral part of what makes a community a whole community. Um, we, we contribute not just by providing a service, but we're contributing because we employ um, a, a significant number and measurable number of people in the community from professional teaching artists to scholars, um, to customer service representatives, um, to um, people are out there doing development, um, getting the word out about what happens and why that's important. Um, but we also are completely in partnership with those organizations that are for profit um, that are driving the business agenda for our community. So our relationships with corporations are extremely important. I mean, envision a bank out there trying to work with a group of um, early childhood learners, um, or there is a law firm out there that really has a special initiative, let's say in LGBTQ issues. Um, how does a law firm go about doing that in a, in a successful way? We partner with community um, corporations and individuals to better reach pockets of our community that are somehow um, geographically isolated or disenfranchised or um, th that needs significant um, development themselves. And we work hand in hand with those organizations to make that happen. We, we are a partner in the community that help makes the economic engine work for everybody from our most economically disadvantaged um, to those that are more affluent and, and more um, well-to-do. We are here for everybody and we wanna make sure that that continues to happen. And that's that partnership. So we work with the public sector and the private sector, um, both the city and the county, um, as well as individuals and corporations that really have only the best interest of the community at heart. So we are part of that economic engine that helps drive success for a community and I'm thrilled that the community wants to be the partner with us. Great. Well, on that note, I'll, I'll just ask, uh, could you please remind us of the website and any final thoughts or words? Sure. Um, we are um, tampamuseum.org. Um, we hope to be um, back up and operational um, in early June. Watch for that. 
Um, and the final words are get ready for all of the exhibits that you missed because we were closed because we were able to extend all of them. So um, come back and see White Gold, Thomas Sayre, Frank Stella's wonderful two different exhibitions that were supposed to open in April will be on view when you come back in June. The Bank of America Women's Exhibition, American um, Modern Women, Modern Vision, one of the most important 20th century surveys of photography by women artists. Don't forget, this is the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote, as well as the 100th anniversary of the museum. So the exhibition schedule is extraordinary, and we want you to come back and, and take partake in that. So we've extended all of our shows through the fall so that you can see them. We didn't want anyone to miss them since we were closed. And my final thought is, thank you, Bill, um, for doing these types of programs for the community. Um, they're important, they get the word out, and your audience is um, our audience, regardless of who they are. And we want them to know what's going on. So thank you. Right. Great. Thank you so much for your creativity and your leadership. And thanks to everybody for watching. Uh, hopefully we'll be back to Cafe on Tampa in person soon. But in the meantime, we'll keep doing some of these interviews so that we can share information with the public. Thanks so much. Thank you.